Well, good morning, and let me add my very warm welcome on to that of Steve's. Uh, my name is James Sant, and uh, God willing, we'll be spending the next couple of weeks uh, looking at 2 Corinthians chapters 4 and 5. Um, and this morning we're looking at 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 7 to 15. Um, 2 Corinthians, and we're going, to be, um, we're going to be reading from 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14, um, and on into our passage. So 2 Corinthians, beginning at chapter 2, verse 14. But thanks be to God who always leads us as captives in Christ's triumphal procession and uses us to spread the aroma of the knowledge of him everywhere. For we are to God the pleasing aroma of Christ among those who are being saved and those who are perishing. To the one we are an aroma that brings death, to the other an aroma that brings life. And who is equal to such a task? Unlike so many, we do not peddle the word of God for profit. On the contrary, in Christ we speak before God with sincerity as those sent from God. Are we beginning to commend ourselves again? Or do we need, like some people, letters of recommendation to you or from you? You yourselves are our letter written on our hearts, known and read by everyone. You show that you are a letter from Christ, the result of our ministry, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. Such confidence we have through Christ before God, not that we are competent in ourselves to claim anything for ourselves, but our competence comes from God. He has made us competent as ministers of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the spirit, for the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. Now, if the ministry that brought death, which was engraved in letters on stone, came with glory so that the Israelites could not look steadily at the face of Moses because of its glory, transitory though it was, will not the ministry of the Spirit be even more glorious? If the ministry that brought condemnation was glorious, how much more glorious is the ministry that brings righteousness? For what was glorious has no glory now in comparison with the surpassing glory. And if what was transitory came with glory, how much greater is the glory of that which lasts? Therefore, since we have such a hope, we are very bold. We are not like Moses, who would put a veil over his face to prevent the Israelites from seeing the end of what was passing away. But their minds were made dull, for to this day that same veil remains when the old covenant is read. It has not been removed, because only in Christ is it taken away. Even to this day, when Moses is read, a veil covers their hearts. But whenever anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all, who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory, are being transformed into him, his image, with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Therefore, since through God's mercy we have this ministry, we do not lose heart. Rather, we have renounced secret and shameful ways. We do not use deception, nor do we distort the word of God. On the contrary, by setting forth the truth plainly, we commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For what we preach is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, and ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who said, let the light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of glory, of God's glory, displayed in the face of Christ. And then our passage this morning. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. We are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed, perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not abandoned, struck down, but not destroyed. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. For we who are alive are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that his life may also be revealed in our mortal body. So then, 
Death is at work in us, but life is at work in you. It is written, I believe, therefore I have spoken. Since we have that same spirit of faith, we also believe and therefore speak. Because we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus from the dead will also raise us with Jesus and present us with you to himself. All this is for your benefit, so that the grace that is reaching more and more people may cause thanksgiving to overflow to the glory of God. Um, before we begin, let us, let us pray. Um, our Lord and loving Heavenly Father, um, we pray that you would um, speak to us today through my weakness. Um, help us to um, hear what you have to say and give us hearts that will we'll, um, listen and want to um, know more about you and be um, uh, changed towards you. Um, help us to love you more this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. What does genuine, glorious gospel ministry look like? And that is the question I want us to be asking ourselves this morning. Um, we've just seen, haven't we, in 1 Kings chapter 8, um, as we've been looking at with Chris, uh, the glory of the Lord descending on the temple. Um, and that was, that was a good contender for the high point of the Old Testament. Uh, the glory of the Lord, God's, God's presence, that, that in Exodus was with Israel and defeated the Egyptians and rescued them up out of Egypt and guided Israel by day and by night with cloud and fire and went with them and would descend on the tabernacle for Moses as Moses would um, speak to and hear from God and intercede for the people and, and in Numbers and Deuteronomy and then at the dedication of the temple in 1 Kings chapter 8 um, as part of the promise made to David is fulfilled and God will have a dwelling place with his people and his glory descends well that glory where is that seen now where is that seen today um, well if we've been going through um, 2 Corinthians which is why I wanted to read um, a little bit more than our passage this morning, we would have seen up to this point, particularly in chapter three in the beginning of chapter four, that God's glory is on display more fully than at the temple in the proclamation and the speaking about Jesus Christ as Lord. But what does that glorious gospel ministry look like? Well, some people tell you that glorious gospel ministry looks well, um, glorious, that where true glory is, there will be um, power, there will be crowds, and it will look spectacular. Lots of churches have been influenced um, by the likes of Bethel Church in America, and their pastor, Bill Johnson, says that with ministry comes gold dust and angel feathers falling from the ceiling, um, and trances and visions. Bill Johnson would say it looks impressive, it looks glorious. Some would say that with glorious ministry would come health and wealth and power. People like Joel Austin and Joyce Meyer, who say that Jesus died that so that we may have an abundant life of health and wealth and material prosperity. But this is not just an American thing. Over in Singapore, a new creation megachurch, Joseph Prince, has said, well, here's, here's a quote for you. You are called by the Lord to be a success, to enjoy wealth to enjoy health and to enjoy a life of victory. It is not the Lord's desire that you live a life of defeat, poverty and failure. In fact, Joseph even thinks there is so much glory in communion that it is impossible to be taking communion correctly and to have cancer. In his, in his book, uh, Eat Your Way to Life and Health, um, which is a book on, uh, on the communion bread and wine, He's, he, calls, he calls communion the proverbial fountain of youth that mankind has been in search for for generations and is more powerful than any medicine, antibiotic or medical procedure. Joel and Joyce and Joseph and, and the prosperity gospel that they represent, if you can even call it a gospel, would say that true ministry looks powerful, 
looks impressive, looks glorious. 24 karat ministry to match their 24 karat lifestyle. Yummy. Now that is the extreme, but even slightly closer to home, you will find lots of ministries that would say similar things. Um, movements like Hillsong, for example, as they promote a gospel that looks impressive and slick and, and, and literally good looking, as they have their celebrity pastors preaching to celebrities. Their ministry is about concerts and the experience and celebrity baptisms in basketball players swimming pools, YouTube channels with millions of hits and VIP areas. And it's about appealing to the young and the cool. And sadly, as we've seen in some of the recent scandals coming out, the impressionable and the vulnerable. But they would say ministry looks powerful, impressive. It looks attractive. And it can be tempting for us to think, um, yes, ministry should look impressive. That's where the glory is. It's where God is, is, is manifest, uh, dis on display, visible. So of course it should. But then the reality is it often doesn't. And in fact, it looks like Preaching your heart out, week in, week out, during a pandemic, lockdown, to five people in a church hall. And maybe a dozen or so watching on YouTube. It looks like someone battling through the after effects of chemotherapy just to preach to a small congregation. It looks like one-to-one -one Bible studies, previously that were in coffee shops, now on Zoom where there is no coffee, just a headache. It looks like picking up the phone and calling someone just to see how they are and speaking words of encouragement from the Bible with them. It looks like witnessing to friends and family that think you're a bit weird and there's something backward about you. It looks like facing hostility and rejection. And for many brothers and sisters across the world, it even looks like serious persecution, risking prison and even death. Just to read the Bible in your home. The truth is ministry feels unimpressive. It feels weak and it feels inglorious. But you see, if this felt like a weird way to start today's sermon, it's because this was one of the key issues at the heart of, the, of Paul's problem with the Corinthians. If Paul had been in the habit of filling up stadia and arguing eloquently with philosophers and, and came with cold gold dust and, and angel feathers falling from the, from the tops of the amphitheatres, the Corinthians wouldn't have had a problem. If they had been paying for him to drive around in a golden chariot with a license plate that said minister with, with a five instead of the S, they would have been on board. But instead they got plain old, pulled apart Paul. Paul who was lowered in a basket in disgrace. Chained up, beaten up, dragged out of town, Paul. And so they started to throw their lot in with the so-called super apostles. And that Paul speaks about a bit more later on, particularly in chapter 11, if you want to have a read. Impressive, intelligent sounding, glorious looking preachers and so here in the heart of this section from, from chapter 2 verse 14 through to chapter 7 verse 2 um, as I think Paul goes through a uh, really a theology of his argument in chapter 4 verse 7 our summary verse as it were this morning what does Paul say this glorious ministry looks like 4 verse 7 we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. Well, it looks like a jar of clay. Um, this glory that we've just read in chapter 3 is more glorious than Moses' shiny face. is found in a clay jar. And what is this clay jar that Paul's talking about? Well, this, this section here, um, and including next week's um, passage from 4, 7 to 5, 10, um, Paul is talking about... The body. For verse 10, we always carry around in the body the death of Jesus. Again, verse 10, 
um, so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in the body. Verse 11, so that his life may also be revealed in our mortal body. Um, and a bit further on in chapter 5, verse 6, we are at home in the body. 5, verse 8. We would prefer to be away from the body, verse 9, whether we're at home in the body or away from it. And then uh, and again, verse 10, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each of us may receive what is due for us, the things well done in the body. And then even those verses in between, as Paul um, changes metaphor a bit and starts talking about uh, tents and buildings, well, he's still actually talking about the body. So that is what Paul means when he uses this metaphor of a clay jar. But what is the point of using it? Well, the point is that clay jars, well, they look unimpressive, breakable, expendable. Um, the equivalent today would be maybe something like a plastic cup or, or, or a paper cup here. Something cheap and not especially cheerful. Something that can be used and thrown away. And so following on from the previous chapter, of all the places that this glory, the more glorious glory can be seen, of all the places that God chooses to put his glory, he chooses jars of clay. And why? Well, because God chooses to display his glory to the world, no longer in a golden temple like in 1 Kings 8, but in clay jar ministry. Clay jar ministry displays God's glory to the world. And it does that in our verses this morning in two ways, two points. Clay jar ministry displays God's glory to the world, firstly, through bruised and broken bodies. And secondly, through spirit sustained speech. Bruised and broken bodies in 8 to 12 and spirit sustained speech. Glorious ministry clay jar ministry looks like bruised and broken bodies and it looks like spirit sustained speech in 13 to 15. two quick points so firstly it looks like bruised and broken bodies let me read again verses 8 to 12. we are hard pressed but not in despair persecuted but not abandoned struck down but not destroyed always carry around in the body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body for we who are alive are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake so that his life may also be revealed in our mortal body so then death is at work in us but life is at work in you um, and this may seem pretty surprising this is hardly a glorious sounding list in verses 8 to 9 is it hard pressed perplexed uh, persecuted struck down um, we all know how that feels quite often but that sounds pretty inglorious they sound more like a description of death and that's even how it's described in 10 to 12. let me read again the first bits we always cry in the body the death of jesus that's looking for we who are alive always been given over to death so then Death is at work in us. Even in the ministry that brought condemnation in chapter 3, verse 9, Moses had a gloriously shiny face. If this ministry of the Spirit, this ministry of righteousness, has more glory, surely we should be able to see it. Surely it should look extra shiny. But the surprise is, well, that it is on display... But it is on display precisely as we see verses 8 to 9. It looks like hard pressed on every side, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. And it is surprising. It's not what we would naturally expect. Um, prosperity preachers would say that glorious ministry looks impressive and powerful. But even on our side of the fence, as it were, we can even be pessimists and essentially agree with that. The ministry should look clothed in power, but we just don't really have that. At least that often. But we're both wrong here. 
because this glorious ministry looks like bone battering, death defying affliction. As someone is down but not out, knocked to the canvas but not out of the fight, still getting to their increasingly wobbly feet to carry on. And it is not going from one moment of glory um, uh, to a moment of affliction and then back to glory. It's not oscillating, no. Ministry is a constant near-death experience. Surprisingly, it looks like a clay jar, a cracking plastic cup. But if we start to connect a few ideas, and actually it should be obvious. You see, when Paul speaks about God's um, glory and God's presence and his, his manifest presence and, and the spirit of the living God and the spirit of the Lord in chapter 3, and then, and then the glory of Christ in 4 verse 4, um, and this all-surpassing power, verse 7, the, the resurrection power, um, this death and life of Jesus, um, it is all basically talking about the same thing. And the key is what is being revealed, uh, carried around in, what is being manifest in the body. And when you see that, it suddenly seems a bit more obvious. It makes sense that God's presence, his glory, his resurrection power, the death and life of Jesus, would be seen most clearly in death to life, clay jar ministry. Precisely because clay jar ministry points to and comes from Christ. And where was God's glory most visible? In the death and resurrection of the Lord Jesus. Um, we've been going through John in our midweek Bible studies, haven't we? Well, Jesus is going to start to um, speak about the moment that he's crucified um, as, as the moment that he is glorified. And he says, now is the Son of Man glorified. That is how Jesus will glorify the Father and how the, the Father will glorify the Son. Where is God's glory seen in the Bible? Well, the absolute peak, the white hot centre, wasn't um, on the shore of the Red Sea as Pharaoh and his army were decimated by God. It wasn't as Moses came down the mountain with a shiny face. It wasn't even at the temple. No, the high point is at the cross. As a bruised, bloodied, broken clay jar hung nailed to a cross of wood. Clay jar ministry means Paul is given over to death as Jesus' death is carried around in his body. And it's so that Jesus' life may be revealed. That is exactly how the Corinthians received life, through Paul's afflicted ministry. Clay jar ministry puts Jesus' resurrection in the spotlight for the world to see. It makes God's glory known to the world. Joel and Joyce and Joseph would say that glory is in crowds and wealth and health and, and even unending youth. Well, Paul says in verse 7... Let me read. We have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. If you want to see glory, look at the cross. If you want to see glorious ministry, look at someone that looks like verses 8 to 9. Hard-pressed, perplexed, persecuted, struck down. Look at a jar of clay. Clay jar ministry displays God's glory to the world, firstly, through bruised and broken bodies. But also, secondly, through spirit-sustained speech. Verses 13 to 15. It is written, I believe, therefore I have spoken. Since we have that same spirit of faith, we also believe and therefore speak. Because we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus from the dead will also raise us with Jesus and present us with you to himself. All this is for your benefit, so that the grace that is reaching more and more people may cause thanksgiving to overflow to the glory of God. Paul says we believe, and so we speak. But it's not just any speech, it is resurrection speech. 
Paul quotes there in verse 13 from Psalm 116, one of the, one of the great psalms about resurrection. Um, let me read a few verses from Psalm 116. Psalm 116, verse 3. The cords of death entangled me. The anguish of the grave came over me. I was overcome by distress and sorrow. Then I called in the name of the Lord. Lord, save me. In verse 8 to 10. For you, Lord, have delivered me from death. My eyes from tears, my feet from stumbling, that I may walk before the Lord in the land of the living. I trust in the Lord when I said... I am greatly afflicted. Speaking is a sign of the spirit of resurrection. The whole reason Paul speaks is because he shares in the psalmist resurrection confidence. Paul has the same spirit of faith. Every time he, see, he speaks, sustained by the spirit, it shows Christ's resurrection. Verse 14, because we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus from the dead will also raise us with Jesus and present us with you to himself. How is God's glory on display to the world? What does glorious ministry look like? Well, it looks like bruised and broken bodies. And also it looks like spirit sustained speech. And again, this could seem surprising. Talk is cheap. Words don't seem all that powerful. Sticks and stones will break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Um, or maybe we think when it comes to ministry, but words will never get anything done. Um, there's a movement started in the 1980s called Power Evangelism. Um, and it basically says that evangelism needs to be words plus signs and wonders. It says words aren't enough. It needs to look impressive to show power. And Paul says, no. Um, don't get me wrong. It's not that Paul was against miracles. Um, you've just got to read the book of Acts to see that through Paul, God did um, some incredible, extraordinary miracles. But Paul's point here is this. That is not what ongoing ministry looks like. That is not clay jar ministry. Um, but again, it is not just the extremes. Uh, the Laws and uh, Conference started with uh, Billy Graham saying um, that there is one mission to spread the word. Um, but then even as, as soon as 1974, that shifted under the great preacher, John Stott, who said that social activity not only follows evangelism as its consequence and aim, and precedes it as its bridge, but also accompanies it as its partner. They are like two blades of a pair of scissors or the two wings of a bird. I think now they have about four main missions. But the point is you won't have to go far to find people that would say that words are not enough. Spirit sustained resurrection speech cannot bring life. Words, well, they're a surprising place to find glory. But again, if we think about it, it should be obvious. Verses 13 to 14, it is written, I believe, therefore I have spoken. Since we have that same spirit of faith, we also believe and therefore speak, because we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus from the dead will also raise us with Jesus and present us with you to himself. With Christ's resurrection power manifest in this spirit sustained speech, well, he who raised Christ Jesus will surely raise us. The glory was most on display not when Jesus, the Word himself, spoke the world into being, and is not when God spoke to Moses on the mountain. But it was as a pierced and broken clay jar hung on the cross and said, it is finished. Resurrection power in resurrection speech about a resurrected 
Jesus Christ as Lord. That is where there's glory. In verse 15, Paul says, it is all for your sake. All of this is for your benefit, so that the grace that is reaching more and more people may cause thanksgiving to overflow to the glory of God. Um, part of Paul's big argument of this section, um, the Corinthians want clever words, clever debate style arguments. They wanted power evangelism, flashy preachers with wit and style and humour, um, the kind of things that about now you'd be thinking that would be quite a welcome break, thanks. Um, but the flash and the pram preaching of the super apostles had no substance because it wasn't resurrection speech. It wasn't spirit sustained speech. It was an empty, hollow, false gospel. Now, this isn't to say that um, when, when Chris comes up with some nice, memorable alliteration, like last week's uh, defeat, drought, disaster, disease, distance, dual displacement, uh, chuck him out, heretic. No, this is not about um, a style of preaching or anything like that, but it is about what is being preached. And the so-called super apostles that Paul was dealing with well, in chapter 4, verse 2, they were using shameful ways. They were practising cunning and were tampering with God's words. They were offering a different gospel to Paul's gospel. And that meant it was a big deal. And so Paul pleads with them later on in chapter in, in, uh, in 2 Corinthians. And he says, get rid of them. Paul says they have to make a choice between Paul and the super apostles. And Paul says, pick me. Pick Paul's bruised and broken body and his, his spirit sustained speech. Because in chapter 6, verse 14, he says, What fellowship can light have with darkness? And chapter 6, verse 15, What harmony is there between Christ and Belial? Or what does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? Paul says it is a binary issue. Um, there is not a plea to come back to, to the church of their youth but to see the glory in the gospel of truth. If the Corinthians didn't come back to Paul and his gospel, well, it meant they just hadn't understood the gospel at all. And, and it meant they even uh, were in need of being reconciled to God. That's where Paul ends up at the end of chapter 5 and verse 20. Paul is defending his gospel, the ministry of the Spirit, but it is not for Paul's sake. Chapter 5, verse 12 says, We are not trying to commend ourselves to you again, but we are giving you an opportunity to take pride in us so that you can answer those who take pride in what is seen rather than, uh, in what is seen rather than what is in the heart. Um, this, this isn't about Paul's uh, ego um, or his crowds or his YouTube numbers. He wants them to see that accepting the true gospel means taking pride in Paul's afflictions. It means coming back to Paul's gospel, but not for Paul's sake. But again, 4 verse 15, all this is for your benefit. So that the grace that is reaching more and more people may cause thanksgiving to overflow to the glory of God. That the grace may extend to more and more more resurrection life to the glory of God, the glory that is on display in a broken clay jar speaking. Paul's gospel, the true gospel, Christ's death and resurrection and lordship, means glory being manifested in believers, all believers, as they are afflicted. It means, verse 13, they believe and therefore they speak. Resurrection speech, spirit sustained speech. Paul says sticks and stones have and will break my bones. But because of the spirit, words will never fail me. God's glory is on display to the world through bruised and broken bodies and in spirit sustained speech. And so as we think about what um, this really means for us, 
But I think it can be tempting for all of us to look at other churches with, with lots of numbers, uh, maybe with celebrity speakers, and think that is where the real glory is. That is where real power is. That is where God is on display to the world. The ministry looks impressive. Or maybe even along with Joel and Joyce and Joseph, we see health and wealth as the sure signs of glorious ministry. Or maybe even it's, it's tempting to look at the things that the world says are glorious, like, like high powered jobs, like, like celebrity endorsements, um, being a social media influencer. Things that have, well, well no glory at all. And Paul says, no, clay jar ministry with affliction and resurrection speech, that's glorious. And so when someone comes along um, or pops onto our news feed that seems to have a shiny face, we're not taken in by the appearance. You know, we could even get downhearted and think our little church here in Stanmore, if only we had real power, real glory, and think what we could achieve. But you see, as whoever gets up to preach each week um, about the Lord Jesus Christ and his death and resurrection and the life that is offered only in Jesus, God's glory is on display there. But it's not just there. It's not just that we need to recognise the glory in, in, in others' clay jar ministry. This is for all of us. Paul in this whole section keeps saying we. Um, and it's not just a royal we. Paul isn't just talking about himself in kind of an roundabout way. And he's not just talking about Paul and, and the other apostles or Paul and his team, like Timothy and Titus. No, chapter four, verse 13 says, since we have that same spirit of faith, we also believe and therefore speak. We, stand with all of us, believe. And so we all speak. Paul could have been reasoning from the beginning in 2 Corinthians um, that, that he's been appointed as an apostle of Jesus Christ. And so the Corinthians, they just need to listen and accept it. Um, but he doesn't. His whole argument is centred around the gospel, the ministry of the spirit, what they have believed. Because the ministry of the spirit, the true gospel, means clay jar ministry has to display the glory to the world. That, that is his point. It can only look like a resurrection. That is what glory looks like. Afflicted bodies and resurrection speech. And so as we have um, all our Bible studies um, and our one-to-ones with people um, and, and small prayer meetings and, and as we speak words of encouragement to one another, maybe on the phone, um, and as we just share the gospel with anyone no matter how small and insignificant and powerless it feels, that is where the glory is. It can be tempting to give up and think I'm barely hanging on. My speaking feels um, more like a whisper at this point. Um, if only I had real um, power and glory. But you see, that is power that is glory that kind of clay jar ministry could only be the resurrection work of the spirit that's what keeps us going if you want to see god's glory on display to the world look at a clay jar look at a bruised and broken body that keeps on speaking we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. Let's pray. Our Lord and loving Heavenly Father, um, we thank you that um, when we are speaking about the risen Lord Jesus, there is uh, more glory there than in Moses' shiny face. Um, Lord, we pray you would help us to um, recognise your glory in uh, jars of clay. Um, help us to um, see it not as weak and powerless, um, but as the way that your spirit, your glory um, is on display to the world. Um, Lord, we pray that you would encourage us.
as we feel hard pressed and perplexed and persecuted and struck down. And we thank you for this glory that we have in jars of clay. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Um, well, our next song speaks uh, somewhat into that kind of situation. Our final end this morning, when trials come. <laughs> 